ויהי כי החל האדם לרוב על פני האדמה, ובנות יולדו להם. וירו בני האלוהים את בנות האדם, כי טובות הנה. ויקחו להם נשים מכל אשר בחרו. הנפלים היו בארץ בימים ההם, וגם אחרי כן אשר יבואו בני האלוהים את בנות האדם, וילדו להם, המה הגיבורים אשר מלעולם, אנשי השם. These are the words of an ancient legend recorded in Genesis 6, what many have often considered one of the most perplexing in the Hebrew Bible. Who were these sons of God, and what were the Nephilim, which the Bible says were their offspring? Among the civilizations of the ancient Near East, Mount Hermon, located just north of Israel on the border of Syria and Lebanon, was revered for its mythology and sacredness. In Semitic, its very root haram means taboo or consecrated. Containing at least 30 cult sites, its summit, called in Arabic Qasar Antar, was the highest temple of the ancient world. It was therefore archaeologically monumental when, in 1869, one of Europe's earliest pioneers in biblical archaeology reached its summit to take detailed notes of his observations. That man was Sir Charles Warren, who, in addition to an extensive military career, served as London's famed chief of police during the Jack the Ripper murders. Most notably, upon the peak of this most sacred mountain, Warren would uncover a stele of grey limestone, cut with a Roman period Greek inscription. The stone, which stood outside a temple dedicated to the god of the mountain, reads, According to the command of the greatest and holy god, Oi Omnuantes, those who take an oath, or those of oath, proceed. Fast forward to early 1947, where a teenage Bedouin shepherd known to his tribe as Muhammad el Dibu, or Muhammad the Wolf, is searching for a stray goat along the desolate cliffs of the western shore of the Dead Sea in modern Israel. It is said that, believing his animal to have taken shade in one of the region's caves, he begins throwing stones into them, but instead of the bleat of a goat, the distinct sound of shattering pottery emerged from within its black depths. Spooked that the pottery may indicate the property of some territorial desert genie, it is said that the wolf initially chose to leave it undisturbed. However, he would return the next day with his cousin after his curiosity haunted his sleep all night before. And so, the first collections of the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. Among the ensuing finds, in Cave 4, would surface Aramaic fragments of a corpus sacred to many early Jews and Christians, and still revered and preserved in the modern Ethiopic church. The Scroll of Enoch The old lore in Enoch's first book of Watchers claims that Genesis 6 refers to a time when divine beings from heaven descended to earth on Mount Hermon in physical form and produced offspring with the daughters of man. These divine human hybrid offspring were powerful giants called Nephilim, and what we know as demons, or Shadim in Hebrew, are now the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. Where the Hermon Summit inscription commands initiates to be bound by an oath before entering, it is said that the entities who descended on Hermon also said, Let us all swear an oath, and all bind one another that we shall not any of us turn aside from this council until we do this deed. Then they all swore together and bound one another by imprecations. And they were all of them two hundred who came down in the days of Jared, on the summit of Mount Hermon and they called the mountain Hermon because they swore and bound one another by imprecations upon it. When I first began researching this passage in college, I found that many modern theologians oppose the ancient view that Genesis 6 intends to say that human beings were producing offspring with supernatural entities. 
believing the Enoch corpus to be a fanciful Jewish misinterpretation. Those who oppose the supernatural view usually believe that the sons of God refer to human rulers, and that the Nephilim were simply a bloodline of thoroughly human fallen warriors. But is it correct to dismiss the supernatural view? In this video, I want to present several of the reasons why I believe the supernatural view is by far the more superior interpretation. The natural place to begin with the identity of the Nephilim is the etymology of the term. The vast majority of academic dictionaries routinely explain this word as the masculine plural form of the Hebrew verb nephal, which means to fall. In other words, the fallen ones. But the linguist Michael Heiser has pointed out a problem for this view. The word Nephilim occurs three times in the Bible. In two of these cases, a stem of nun, fe, lamed, for, to fall, makes intuitive sense. But in Numbers 13.33, there's a complication with this etymology. There the word is spelled with an extra yod in its center. Biblical Hebrew had no symbols for vowels, so sometimes consonants that double as vowels, like the letter Y, could be used to clarify the presence of a vowel pronunciation in a spelling. In this variant spelling in Numbers 13, we see a scribal gloss, indicating the base word of Nephilim was originally pronounced with a long E. This means that the word Nephilim can't be derived from a verb like to fall, because verbal forms in Hebrew are never spelled this way. The masculine plural participle of nephal is patterned with a long o instead of an e. There is, however, an alternative root that does conform to the variant spelling, the Aramaic noun nafil. This Aramaic root contains a middle yod and would therefore resolve the morphological problem, but does its meaning provide explanatory power? The Aramaic word nafil means giant. This etymology is powerfully supported by the fact that Jewish texts from the intertestamental period consistently translate the Nephilim with the Greek word gigantis. Notice also the gigantism of the Nephilim tribes in the Bible, for example, Numbers 13, 32 through 33. All the people we saw in the land are of great height, and there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who came from the Nephilim, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. It makes little sense that regular human rulers would produce giant bloodlines. However, the gigantism of the Nephilim coheres well with the view that they were fathered by divine beings. Additional support for the divine interpretation comes from the virtually unanimous witness of early Jewish interpretation in general, but I will focus here only on the New Testament, particularly Jude 6-7 through and 2 Peter 2-4. Both of these passages reference rebellious angels kept in chains under gloomy darkness until a day of judgment. But how can we know that Peter and Jude here are referring to the angels being punished for the sort of crimes described in Enoch? First, the Greek word hell in 2 Peter is not the expected word Hades or Gehenna, but the strange word Tartarus, which occurs nowhere else in the New Testament. As David Bartlett writes, this term was used in Greek mythology to describe, quote, the lowest part of the underworld where the Titan giants were kept in chains by Greek gods for their rebellion against them. Pearson's study confirms this is certainly the correct background for this passage because the odd reference to these angels being bound in chains and in gloomy darkness occurs in conceptual and linguistic parallel in Hesiod's description of the Titan's imprisonment. Ancient Jewish authors drew a direct parallel to the old Greek myth that the Titans were chained within the underworld and the tradition about the same happening to the Watchers. Enoch especially makes this connection to the Greek myth explicit in its telling of the legend. So when Peter and Jude relate the sin of these angels to the Greek concept of these entities being bound in Tartarus, they are showing that they hold to the old tradition shared by Enoch. This should come as no surprise, considering Jude especially has been shown to be heavily relying on themes and terms found in Greek Enoch, and even approvingly quotes Enoch by name in chapter 14. Observe again Jude 6-7. through And the angels, who did not stay within their own position of authority, 
but left their proper dwelling, he is kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which like them, Totois, indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Does the phrase which likewise indulged in sexual immorality refer back to the cities surrounding Sodom and Gomorrah, or is its antecedent the angels? In Greek, the gender and number of the pronoun totois is masculine plural. It therefore doesn't grammatically agree with cities because that word is feminine. However, totois corresponds in number and gender to the term for angels, making it the only candidate as the antecedent. These angels were punished in Jude's mind for sexual immorality. In an article published in the Journal for the Study of the Pseudepigrapha, the Estonian Assyriologist Amar Annis discusses Mesopotamian tablets that allude to a group of deities called Apkalus. In Babylonian myth, before the Great Flood, these creatures were believed to have first delivered culture and civilization to humanity. Often in Babylonian buildings, little statues of these Apkalu were placed in deposits of brick, under pavement and flanking walls and gates. The idea was that they would serve as divine sentinels, watching over and protecting the occupants. Annis recognized that some of the inscriptions point-blank title these Apkalu guardians, Watchers. The Watchers are not just found in extra-biblical books like Enoch, but in Daniel 4.13 and 4.17, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar reports visions he had of a, quote, Watcher descending from heaven, and the Aramaic of verse 17 likewise pairs the decree of these Watchers with the decree of the Kadashin, the Holy Ones, one of the most common titles for the heavenly sons of God. So the tradition about the Watchers preserved in Enoch was not just a later Jewish invention. Rather, it is best explained as dating back to Israel's exile in Babylonia, when Judaism would have interacted with Mesopotamian myth. This is no surprise considering Genesis 6 immediately commences with the flood story which likewise shows literary awareness of the Mesopotamian flood legend, where mainstream Babylonian religion casts these entities as good benefactors of humanity. The Bible takes the position that they were corruptors of it, that motivated God's bringing of the flood. So, the supernatural interpretation is supported by the gigantism of the Nephilim in the Bible. It is the view taken by the New Testament authors. And now, we have contemporaneous inscription evidence demonstrating the Mesopotamian context of the legend, and the title, Watchers. Watchers.